excited to be here. Um, thanks to Sima for inviting me, and also thanks for, to the whole team for having me. Uh, my name is Elie Franzke, and I want to present today uh, four things. First, I want to talk shortly about Utrecht, um, a smart city, uh, where I developed uh, the data ethics decision aid. Um, I want to go briefly into why ethics is needed in the context of smart cities. Um, I want to show that on an example, and then I want to tell you the long and painful story of developing this tool. And I'm suffering a little bit of low blood pressure in this day, so I hope I will not collapse. <laughs> Good. Okay, so. <laughs> So Utrecht, um, I don't know who had heard of it um, already before. In the Netherlands, it seemed to be like a battle. Who is the most in in innovative place? Um, who is the smartest city? Um, they develop um, um, sound tracking in streets um, for lights. Then they have um, kind of um, predictive policing systems. Um, they start to also work on garbage collection with data analysis, all kinds of this type. So, example, um, what can be wrong with preventing poverty? That was a case that um, really came up during the presentation in the municipality of Utrecht where I work. Um, it was it's just it was an idea, so it was not put into practice. Uh, but the idea was why couldn't we combine health data? with bank, ex, uh, bank accounts of people um, to see who might be in danger of falling to poverty. Well, uh, <laughs> this sounds really great, but there are some problems. Um, first of all, of course, there are security issues, um, but then also categorization issues. So, for example, who then tells what is poor and what is rich? Um, what does it mean when I am in the category of being poor, which I probably always would have been, um, in front of the um, government, all type of biases that, that might be uh, part of it, but also the frequently discussed um, privacy issues, and also how do you inform people that you want to do this kind of uh, things with their data, and in the end, the question of autonomy. So what kind of um, mention build do we have? Uh, how do we believe? Are people free? Are they autonomous? Can they decide for themselves? Um, is there something like a right to fail? Something like that. So what we see in this um, smart city developments is a boom of ethics um, and kind of this idea that ethics can fix everything. Uh, uh, it's frequently heard and said like, yeah, okay, uh, we need to do that ethically, but it's actually not really clear how to do it ethically. And also not very clear what people mean when they talk about ethics. So there is, every one of us has kind of a moral gut feeling, an intuition, a feeling of like, okay, this is right and this is wrong. And what I saw in the municipality of Utrecht is that they really want to do the best. It's not that they are this state people that are just into um, surveillance and controlling the masses, which I kind of assumed before. Uh, but it's really, they, they, they really try to do their job. The thing is that there are so many unpredicted outcomes in next steps that it's difficult to, to, to trust a, um, a gut feeling of one. And then also when we talk about ethics, I mean, there are so many different school of e different ethical schools, and so it's really difficult to, to come up with kind of normativity in a field that is so developing. So um, that was kind of a little bit the context in which um, the uh, DIDA, Data Ethics Decision Ed, was um, developed. So it was for the municipality of Utrecht, and um, they came to me and said, like, we want to have a decision tool where you put an ethical question in, in the beginning, and then you get um, the perfect outcome. <laughs> so I started with that in 2015 and I was really saying, wow, how shall I ever um, do that? Uh, they wanted to have kind of decision tree approach, like, yes, 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 okay, yes, cool, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> so that was the prototype number one, a really ugly thingy, uh, which is not, uh, it's not, um, it's not a decision tree, uh, it's also not beautiful, but it's more like a questionnaire, so you start with, uh, do you have any doubts about the project? 
and then uh, if you ask one time yes I have or no then just do it all over again it's not uh, prescriptive and it's really focusing on the common good okay but then I still felt after um, presenting this I mean it was really after two months or something so after presenting this I felt like okay this is just that's crap let's continue so uh, that was the second version. Um, it was a more boxes approach, uh, telling people a little bit more right, about privacy, biases, responsibility. But then I realized, OK, it's not worth anything. You can have the most uh, beautiful thing when people are not engaged. You will never get the reflection process started. So um, I felt, OK, it's not interactive enough. And what are you doing in these days when you need something interactive? You go for an app. Okay, so I then uh, the next version was an app. So it was this: Hi, I'm Dida, your data ethics decision A. My goal is to raise ethical awareness um, surrounding data practices. Nadi, 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 na, and nadi, na. Okay, and then I I was of course um, checking the answers. I figured out that people are just jumping through the questions that they try to be finished as fast as possible, that it's not working at all. So okay, this app idea uh, was not leading to anywhere. Um, so I thought, okay, how can we actually, I mean, these people really, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this is really, like in Utrecht, they are really implementing already this whole technologies. They are implementing already, um, they track people's mobile devices to, to see where people move within the city. So I really felt, okay, there is some pressure on me. I, I can, there is a need that this is going well. So then I thought, okay, maybe we need something more. Yeah, good. That was uh, the next. It's like, it looks a little bit like this Pokemon ball, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> so this was already then a table poster um, where people can sit around. So it was this idea of, okay, you bring in people from different um, parties to talk with each other. Good. That was now the, the, the final version. So what is this? Uh, it's the spiral of despair, or I don't know. No, but it's, it's, um, it's a, a tool, a game. Um, it's a questionnaire with about 80 questions. It's not a code of conduct. I was frequently asked to develop a code of conduct, which I find super problematical. Um, code of conducts are not really the way to go, I believe. It's a dialogical um, tool for all those people who collect data, clean these data sets, visualize these data sets, and make, um, based on this visualization, make policy. On them. And the point is that frequently it's third parties who collect this data and they never ever speak with those who finally make policy based on these data sets. So, and in each step there, is, there are some decisions in, involved where people feel like, ah, yeah, okay, this is the limit of the data set, or ah, no, okay, I cut this out, or, and this is not, not visible anymore. Um, yeah. So then it's a tool that is made for the task, it's context sensitive in the sense of that it's really made for uh, big data, big data, I don't know, like yeah, data and big in, in brackets um, for municipalities. And then there is an 80 pages handbook with further explanation on the involved topics. Okay, so then I think what I've tried to achieve is that it's not really a one school, but it's really, it is kind of an ethical, pluralistic approach. Okay, so how does this thing work? We have uh, four steps on it. So you start with um, data-related considerations, then you have general considerations, and in the end you have um, a, a game, a case deliberation game. So when, why do we start with, with technical questions? So there are questions um, concerning algorithms, the source of the data set, how to anonymize data, how to visualize it, and how to make, um, how to control the access. So who has um, the encryption key? How do you want to reuse it, and so on. Um, and it's first. So I started with the technical questions because, as I mentioned earlier, I really believe that in each step, like ethics is in between. Um, 
So after technical questions, there are more questions of the responsibility. What kind of picture? So do we, what is the responsibility of a government? How how like what kind of democratic understanding do we have? Um, how much uh, privacy do, should people have? Uh, what about all the biases and so on? And then in the end, that's the best part, I think. <laughs> there is this case deliberation game where uh, people, uh, so I split usually, I split the groups and the one group is presenting the pro arguments why this project needs to be done. For example, we need to track people's mobile devices because it's an amazing tool, we can see where they move within the city, we are anonymizing the data anyway, so uh, it's really helping us to make great bridges and to really see where there are problems. Uh, and then the other group is the devil's advocate and the other group uh, needs to bring contra arguments why this practice might be problematical. And what I've, tr like what I've tried to achieve by that is that um, this super euphoric, technophoric approach of yes, 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 we cannot sit still, we have to do everything we can do. I mean, this, this vibe is very different here in Germany, I feel, but in, in the Netherlands is extremely technophoric. So I try to slow this down a bit. So why the spiral shape? Um, people told me like that, it's kind of messy. Why it's like a little bit, so that there are some thoughts behind it. Um, so first of all, it slows down the, pro uh, the process of decision making. So you really need to sit and you need to talk. And uh, you walk towards a decision, so you start with this very big question of shall we do it or not? And instead of saying, okay, let's talk about philosophy, where you end up with, am I alive or not? Uh, <laughs> let's make it like as focused as possible and start with the context and walk slowly towards a decision. And then it should increase the dialogue between those parties, as I mentioned before, who, who collect it and so on. And then another thing uh, why the, the spiral, uh, I figured out that people who um, have very critical thoughts tend to not say them in group settings. Mm -hmm. So by putting the, um, the spiral shape, you cannot read each question uh, at each point. That means you need, when you sit on that side of the table, you can read these questions, and when you sit on that, you can read that question. And by that, I try to kind of break this hierarchy within groups where always the loudest talk the most but have not the most to say. And then the spiral also because it's a little bit like a fractal and then it's getting more complex and stuff like that. So what I said as a benefit before that it's slowing down the process, it's also a little bit a drawback, of course. Um, it's not really hip to have slow decision processes. So this can be, of course, a limitation. And then the biggest problem is that it's really conflicting with current business culture. Simon and me were talking about that earlier. So how do you sell it? Um, when you are, when you want to make a profit, for example, it's not really something you want to think of, like yeah, responsibility, privacy. Yeah, how do we get this covered? But um, I, I think that, um, or I hope that, with raising uh, public um, awareness, also um, companies and governments really understand that they need to look into this point that they that reflection processes make their decisions better um, and also will help them to communicate with the public and also open these things for, for democratic processes because actually we are shaping here uh, a city and um, yeah, it would be nice to inform the public about what is going on and not just do it behind closed doors. Another limitation might be that um, a facilitator is needed. With this tool, um, why all of you that have worked on privacy issues, for example, know that it's a huge field and that there is a huge tradition and each involved concept is super complex. So that's um, a reason why I think it could be a drawback that this kind of tool needs someone who is kind of moderating it and ask people like, oh, what? Mm -hmm. so you, you get the point. So to conclude, um, lessons that I have learned from this process First of all, um, I have shown you some uh, prototypes, and this is now the current version. I think you're never really done. 
um, when you when you think about data ethical frameworks, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a work in progress, and you have to be kind of embracing this and need to be open for it's just uh, always. Uh, and then another uh, lesson learned, to be interactive can be also, I mean, that's really logical from what I said before, but to be interactive does not necessarily mean to be digital. So I think in this, um, like this tool is especially useful and it has proven to be useful also for Schiphol Airport and other uh, bigger companies, IMB and banks and stuff and other uh, municipalities within the Netherlands. It has proven to be good because it really, people start to talk, and that's really not really common anymore. Um, and then another thing is um, that by talking with each other, simple as that, <laughs> you really learn about more problems and issues, and I think that's also then really useful to feed it in back into the tool development and to, to keep the process open. So, and then another thing is that ethical issues are more complex than just privacy issues, because privacy issues are actually now the best known problems, but they are also best covered by law. So, um, yeah. Well, this was it. Thank you for your attention.